Welcome back to the Wolf Den presented by Win Again Academy. I'm Matt Wolf, founder and CEO of Ticket Time Machine. Today, we welcome Ed Vincent to the show. Welcome to the Wolf Den. Hey, Matt. How you doing? Glad to be here. Uh, good to have you here. We're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, music and then music festivals, of course. For the people in the audience who don't know who you are, give us a, a quick uh, rundown and let's get into it. Sure. So I'm the founder and CEO of Festival Pass. Uh, Festival Pass is a subscription marketplace uh, membership for live events. So um, in general, people pay a monthly subscription uh, or an annual subscription. They receive credits and they can spend those credits at over 80,000 live events and 600,000 hotel rooms. Yeah, it's, um, I always get a little bit of uh, backlash. Not bad. My, my friend tells me, well, your thing is called Ticket Time Machine, but you're talking about badges and credentials and you're <laughs> festival pass, but you're talking about stuff that's not festivals. I mean, it's it's uh, it's interesting. It doesn't it doesn't matter that it's called Festival Pass, but you want people to understand it's more than just uh, festivals. How do you do that? Yeah, so so the way I kind of explain it, right, is festivals to me, uh, especially in kind of the millennial and Gen Z world, has always evoked some emotion and passion. So um, part of the the world is to get people excited to say, oh wow, you know, in my mind, everything's a festival. Of course, there are things that are specifically festivals, and we have all those on the platform. Um, but we have more than just that, right? So we have concerts, we have, uh, you know, professional sports, college sports, Broadway theater, comedy, um, all on the platform. But uh, the, the idea of a festival evokes an emotional response, and I think gets people excited. What percent of events being used on your platform are music based? I'd say music vase is, uh, is the number one category. <clears throat> so, you know, I, I, I don't know, I'd have to look at some analytics to, to tell you the exact answer, but probably half of all of the events we have on our platform are music. And then the second largest category is sports. Yeah. Uh, well, let's talk about current events, some stuff that's in the news. This past weekend in Vegas was the When We Were Young Festival. Uh, first day got winded out. Never, haven't heard of that uh, yet. Um, but they canceled all the performances and people were scrambling. It's a big, uh, big event with a big lineup and there were some pop-up shows all the way. What, what, to, what is, what do you say to someone who paid a lot of money to travel there and, and something like that happens? I mean, it's inevitable, not inevitable, it's unavoidable in a way. I and mean, I, I assume it was too dangerous for them to, uh, put stuff on. Um, you know, weird that the next day was fine, but that happens all the time. I was, I, I was once at a football game in snow, freezing. The next day, I'm tailgating at another football game in shorts. So, sure, yeah, I, I was, I was curious myself because even in here, the weather has been crazy this this year everywhere, um, and even here in Austin, Texas, far from Vegas, um, there was F1 all weekend, and uh, you know, I was surprised during the race on Sunday. I'm sitting here at my house. I went to F1 on, on Friday, um, but it was so windy. I'm like, I wonder what it's going to be like to drive cars in this wind. Um, but when you get back to the festival that you're talking about, um, the when we were a young festival in Vegas, you know, it, it just, I just, it is what it is, right? It's like people have to understand that no matter what, um, safety comes first. And, you know, when you go to something like that, there's going to be disappointment. You're going to spend money on hotels to be there. It's going to be frustrating. Um, but, but I suspect there'll be, you know, um, the ability for, for them to get refunds or the ability for them to at least, uh, you know, get value out of it. Um, got, they got, a, they got a stacked lineup for next year. It's like, you look at something like that and there's a, been a few times when I've seen a, a poster for a festival, I'm like, there's, there's no way this is going to happen. They can't have all these people in, in the same festival at once. Um, but I, th it, you know, it's backed by Live Nation, I think, right, or Ticketmaster. So it, I feel like it's legit. It's crazy, crazy the the amount of, uh, you know, the bands that are going to be at this this one next year, especially with Blink, uh, Blink coming back. How, do you expect Blink to be on a lot of festivals? I think they have a Live Nation uh, contract. But I mean, when you hear something like that, when you have someone like Taylor Swift putting out a new lineup, is that is that something that you know? Uh, you expect to see them uh, headlining festivals. I think Beyonce's touring again. Um, but do you expect to see all of them headlining these festivals next year? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think a good point is uh, th there's there's the combination of both, right? So when when a band chooses to go on tour, whether they're uh, whoever is producing them, whether it's Live Nation or anybody else, um, you know, the band's going on tour, and some of those tour stops, if if it makes sense in their travel schedule, will be festivals, right? Festivals are great for bands, they're great for for audiences, they're great for everybody. Um, so the answer is yes. I mean, I think Blink is coming through Austin in the next couple months as well, uh, just for a concert, not even a tour. But but to your point is, yeah, when, when a band decides to go on tour, festivals are a big piece of that. Yeah, one thing I want to also ask you about, it's I guess it's not really festival related, but the whole Kanye West incident. When something like that happens <laughs> and these people are headlining a festival, they almost immediately get, it's it. You're not, we're not going to have any part of it. And Adidas kind of drags their feet uh, on this. What, what's your take as a corporation, you know, that has affiliation with someone like that and, and doesn't take immediate action? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if you even saw the news this morning is they did finally take action. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they dragged their feet for a while. But yes, Adidas did finally take action. CAA dropped them. You know, it's. I can't be the voice for corporations in general. There's always somebody always has a reason or they, they move slower or they don't want to be reactionary. Um, but, you know, I think, I think in general, everybody can agree that there's, there's no, uh, there's no place for that kind of uh, conversation in, in our, in our country or our world or whatever is, you know, the, the idea of it, this, you know, just having Kanye even have discussions like that, you know, sometimes people have to ask is how well is he? Yeah, I think, you know, Howard Stern was talking last week about, you know, mental health. Uh, we're a big mental health advocate here. We champion with the hashtag same here, which is, uh, you know, hashtag five and five. There's some stuff scrolling at the bottom about mental health. Like there's no excuse if even if it's mental health. There's plenty of people with mental health issues who don't go spewing that kind of stuff. But I think it's it's you know, fans that kind of get screwed. Like, let's say he was headlining at a festival and yep. you know, people, a ton of people, again, want to see it. You can separate the artist from there, but understand, look, they, you can't have something like that. And festivals are so, um, I don't know, they're so, I don't know what the word is, fluid or just the lineups. You just, you just never know what's going to happen. Like, you know, Blink is on tour and and he get, and Mark gets cancer or someone makes a comment like that. Or now, nowadays yep. we've got to, worry about COVID when someone's planning for a festival um, for me to go like travel for a festival, I think I probably have to have like two or three acts that I really want to see just in case who knows what the schedule is going to look like. If someone doesn't perform, what, what would your strategy be if you're, you know, traveling to go see something like this, not just in your backyard, but you got to make an effort. You're, you're making travel plans. You're either driving, flying, booking a hotel, buying tickets. Well, and I think you bring up a good point of why festivals are so great, right? So at the end of the day, they, they have a large lineup. Um, and, you know, to be in a, an environment where you're going for the experience, and usually festivals specifically have a, have a vibe, right? So like if you're going to EDC, you're, you're in, you know, into EDM. If you're going to Coachella, you're more into kind of the overall popular music that are, is coming through. You know, I went to Okeechobee last year. <laughs> um, where, you know, I know the guy that, that owns it and runs it. And, you know, it, it, it's a great mix of different um, of different lineups. But when you're there, you're going for the vibe. You're going for the the thing that it feels. And if one or two acts don't show, I mean, you just got to roll with it, right? It's just, a, it's, it's you, you can't go hoping only for one act. That's why festivals are much even better than a concert, right? If a concert cancels, right, that you're going for one person. And uh, you're, you obviously are going to miss that. Yeah, I, I'm a f big FOMO guy. So when I go to these festivals and I got to go, uh, go from one to the next and you're like, I got to decide when do I want to go? Am I going to miss the song that I wanted to hear from them and go? So I'm more of a like a one day guy or a one stage guy to not have to, you know, pick and choose. Some of the festivals these days are geared more towards the big acts here and the smaller acts there, which I think has been helpful. I'm a, I'm a headliner guy, but but ultimately any festival – I go to, I find people that I never heard of or didn't know much about that I, that I enjoy seeing. I haven't been to too many festivals where I'm like, man, this is boring, you know, and that's a tribute to the music, but also these festivals have to become more of a, of an event. 
Yeah, and the one thing I noticed is, uh, especially with ACL just happening, uh, you know, within the last month here in, in Austin, is a lot of the bigger festivals, both from a cost perspective and from a, um, you know, longevity perspective, are doing two weekends. And often the two weekends that are happening, like especially here at ACL, they brought back the same headliners both weekends. So it's kind of like you want to see pink, you know you're going on Saturday night. And if you ha if something happened and you happen to miss it, on that one Saturday, you can come back the next Saturday and she'll be there again. Um, same with the uh, Chili Peppers, same with, you know, all, all the entire lineup that were the main headliners there um, were there on the same specific day on both weekends. And I think that's becoming a little bit of a trend for some of the bigger festivals. Yeah, and offering, uh, we, we're, we're uh, big fans of the Four Chord Music Festival in uh, in Pittsburgh, and they always have like rex wrestling exhibitions and stuff like that. We had uh, John uh, D'Esposito, who's bringing back Bamboozle Festival next year, and he's going to have amusement park rides. I mean, again, something for, for people to do. Well, you can listen to music. You can hear the music, but there's also other stuff, activations, brands, booths that are selling stuff, yeah. cause, good causes. I think you kind of need to do that. Absolutely. I mean, I think people go for that, that main reason, and you know, to not, not to keep talking about Okeechobee, it just is top of mind that I went last year. It was great, right? They had a whole beach area during the day. People can hang out. It felt like you're at like a, uh, you know, a hip hotel pool bar uh, during the day. And then as it got, you know, into later in the afternoon, some of the, some of the uh, performers would kick off. And then, you know, anyway, it just, uh, it's an experience. Festivals in general are an experience that, you know, once, once somebody gets addicted to a festival, they often go to many. Yeah, we have, you know, having a single day, two day, three day, there's companies that are popping up to sort of help people resell or if there's something that's sold out and, and work on return, sort of the secondary market. And that's what Festival Pass kind of does, right? Because you're not you're not buying from uh, direct from the show, but you're using credits. Uh, does there uh, maybe you need analytics for this? The way Festival Pass works, does someone have an idea of how much they're paying for an event, for a festival, for an event? And what does that, how does that compare to other sites? Yeah, so I'll, I'll answer the, the first thing. One is a correction is um, while we do have our inventory on Festival Pass, the, the ability to have over 80,000 events throughout the year, usually 10 to 20,000, you know, always available at any given time. Um, we source our inventory from from many many different places um some a good majority do come from the secondary market that you reference um where um you know we're we're getting uh pretty much all the tickets that are available out there on any secondary market through our our, our sources um, but we do also have direct relationships with a lot of producers and events and venues um that that are direct that we um that we have the relationship and bring onto the platform. So it's both. I just want to, uh, you know, share that it's not just only secondary, but there is a good portion of secondary. So to answer your second question on the credits is um, it's, it's a dynamic based credit system. So, um, you know, the, um, when somebody get, uh, signs up for either our monthly subscription, annual subscription, or our NFT, and we can talk about the NFT in a little bit, um, which is a, a massive value, um, they get credits into their account. And once credits are in their account, they can use them to go to anything they want to use them on. Um, we have some events that could be a local band playing, you know, in a, in a nearby venue that might cost 15 or 20 credits. And then of course, if you want to go to a three-day festival, you might you might have to spend three or three or four hundred credits uh, to go to that. So it's very analogous to the pricing that exists for the one-off tickets. Um, where where we come in and have value is once you're a member of Festival Pass, um, we don't create added ticketing fees on top of the uh, the ticket, right? So um, you know, many times you'll people will go to a transactional-based ticketing environment and they'll think the ticket's $100 and then when they go check out, it's like $150. Um, so we remove all of that lack of transparency and we don't put added fees on top. So, so it, it typically as a member, um, you'll depending on what level member you are, you're going to be paying anywhere from 5 to 30% less for your tickets through Festival Pass than you would elsewhere because of the fact that we're not adding those fees on top. So if I have a membership, you're you're confident that I, let's say I have an, uh, 
for a year, you're confident that throughout that year, I, I can see the events that I want to see through Festival Pass without having to buy elsewhere. Correct. So I, I use this analogy a lot as um, Amazon Prime. So everybody knows Amazon Prime. And I would ask somebody, any, you know, 90, nine out of 10 people, you ask, why do you have Amazon Prime? And the answer is going to be, well, I get free shipping and I get some free movies through Amazon Prime Video and I get some discounts at Whole Foods and I get, you know, and, and, and on the benefits. Um, but the reason they're there is for that main kind of, uh, you know, free shipping. But what happens in that environment is um, whenever you somebody that has Amazon Prime chooses to buy something online, because they're a Prime member, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to check Amazon and see if they have the product they want. 80% of the time, I'm using that loosely, I don't know exactly the percentage, but 80% of the time, they're going to have the product that, um, that the person wants, and they're going to usually buy it through Amazon because they already have the infrastructure in place. They already have their credit card there. They already have... Um, free shipping coming. Um, and as long as most of the time Amazon has the product, there's no reason not to continue to go back to Amazon. So we have the same kind of philosophy with Festival Pass is once you're a member of Festival Pass and you have credits in the Festival Pass ecosystem, each time you want to go to an event, come come check out your account of Festival Pass. Most of the time, I don't know if it's going to be 80%, 70%, or 90%, depending upon the type of event you want to go to, but most of the time, we will have that event on our platform. And you'll already have your credits, and you'll be able to know you're always going to be getting it less than anywhere else. And your credits are already on the platform, and it's a super easy experience. Um, and we provide you know other access to community and other benefits. We have discounts on hotel rooms uh, that you can use your credits for. Uh, as well as, you know, over time, we're going to be adding a lot more really fun benefits for our members. Um, so if you can use that analogy that, yes, almost any event you want to go to is likely to be on Festival Pass. And if we and don't have it, that's fine. The the event industry, uh, music festivals, concerts are very cyclical. If I sign up for you, I get X amount of credits per month. Can I use all of my credits in one month? Um, so if you're a monthly member, you effectively get a certain amount of credits per month. So if you sign up for a $99 per month plan, you're getting 90 credits a month. So yes, it, it, the first month you get the 90 credits, 30 days later, you, you get 90 more credits, 30 days later, you get 90 more. So you can choose to use them whenever you want. You can let them accumulate. So, you know, in six months, you'll end up having, you know, 90, 90 times six, uh, and then you can use that for whatever you want. Or if you buy the annual plan, um, you'll get your credits right up front. So if you purchase the annual subscription, the annual founder subscription to Festival Pass, you'll get 1,080 credits immediately into your account, and you can use them for however you want throughout the year. You can use them all in the next day. You can use them the, the second month, whenever you want. And then the following year, um, you know, you would have to re-up for another year. But you could always buy more credits. So if I had a, yeah. I had a lower plan with less credits and I wanted to buy a credit, there's a price, a price per credit that you paid that you can just buy more. Yeah. And the way I, uh, the, the reality of it, the way it is, is the more you commit on a monthly basis, the cheaper per credit price you pay. Right. So if, if you're a $19 a month member, you're paying about $1.27 a credit. If you're a $49 a month member, you're paying about $1.17 a credit. And if you're a $99 a month member, you're paying about $1.10 a credit. But if you prepay for the year, and let's say you do the annual founder plan, you're paying only about $1 a dollar a credit. So that, that becomes, you're paying effectively 27% less than somebody who's the lowest monthly member. Right. And how, how many people are, are, do you have an idea of what people are signing up for the, you know, for your three tiers? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. We, we see a lot of people that will, um, you know, initially sign up for free and then and then they want to actually go to an event. So they'll they'll buy the, the, the lower plan, the $19 a month plan. And then we see a lot of those $19 a month plans, uh, once they are comfortable with the system, realize that, uh, hey, I get more value out of the higher plan and then they upgrade to the $99 a month. Yeah, because you want to you dip your toes in it to see like, hey, what does this look like? But on the other hand, I, I assume not you know these credits for a big event you're gonna have to have them accumulated otherwise you're just 
buying extra credits to get to an event. Yeah, at nineteen dollars a month, you know, you might be able to uh, see like one local show per month, but um, you know, for that to would have to accumulate over time in order to go to a big festival or a big major concert. Um, so the answer is yes, and you know, the truth is, is if you're if you're gonna spend a few hundred dollars for a ticket for a concert. Um, you might as well sign up for the higher plan or even the annual plan and get the most value out of it. Yeah, that's what I would think looking at it. It's good, it's a, it's good value. Uh, you talk about the NFT. Let's uh, hear more about the, the NFT that you guys are doing. I know you and I have talked about before, uh, a lot of good value there. Yeah, it is. It, as we speak today, it's probably the best value you can probably ever find in live events, um, at least for now. Uh, and I'll explain what that means. So um, we have a lifetime founder NFT. And what it means is once you mint or purchase that NFT, um, you basically get $1,200 worth of credits immediately. So you get the 1,080 credits immediately into your account. And then every year thereafter on the mint date, you get another $1,200 worth of credits. So basically it's a lifetime of live events for the one price you pay today. And not only that, if anybody understands the way NFTs work is you own that NFT. So you're free to sell it whenever you want in the future. Um, the reason why that's important from a value standpoint is we're only selling a total of 10,000 of these NFTs uh, throughout now, out throughout 2023. And um, currently we're selling the first 1,000 of those uh, of those 10,000 and it's at the cheapest price that will ever be. So we're selling the first thousand right now at 0.95 Ethereum, which means in today's dollars, I think Ethereum's about 1350 right now. So it's about, call it $1,250, $1,300 in total. And so if you're spending $1,300 today, you're immediately getting back $1,200 in credits and you're getting a lifetime of $1,200 every year for as long as you own it. And you could always sell it in the future and either get your money back or, or maybe two to three extra money back. Uh, that's not investment advice, but in general, um, the reason why it's likely to go up in value is after we sell the first thousand, we're going to increase the price before we sell the next thousand. And then we're going to increase the price before we sell the next thousand. So by the time we sell the last one thousand, probably sometime in mid 2023, um, we'll be selling it for probably around two and a half to three Ethereum. Um, so it's going to be, you know, likely to be two to three times worth more than somebody who bought it today. And we got uh, put that up there for anyone who wants uh, to take advantage of it. Um, you have, you're selling the first thousand with the character. Uh, how many did you say you guys have sold so far? Uh, we sold a little over a hundred so far. Um, and uh, we actually, your audience will probably like this. We just launched a partnership with Liquid Death. Are you familiar with the water, Liquid Death? Water. <laughs> um, so, so as of right now, uh, all Liquid Liquid Death has their own NFT called the Murderhead Death Club. So uh, anybody that actually has a Murderhead can can buy our NFT, and they actually get a 0.1 Ethereum cashback offer. So, so it's basically like 10% cheaper just because you're a Liquid Death Murderhead holder. Um, so anyway, it's just a lot of fun things we're doing with a lot of different brands. We have four or five other really cool brand partnerships that we'll announce uh, shortly as they come forth that are very um, relatable to music and, and live events. Um, but I think the point I'm trying to make is that um, we're just now creating some marketing exposure with other like-minded brands. So, you know, I would, I would jump in if somebody wanted to get the NFT. You can use a credit card to mint it too. You don't have to already have a wallet. Um, we'll help you through all that. Um, but you know, I suspect over the next few months, those a thousand will sell out pretty quick. Uh, and then we'll be moving to the second tranche, which is a higher price. So is that the $1,200 of credits that you're not actually a member of festival pass? It's just the, you're a holder of the NFT. Well, but that's one of the benefits of being the holder of the NFT. You, you become a founding festival pass member. So you're effectively getting our annual founder plan. What, what would cost you, um, you know, close to $1,200 annually to join on a regular basis, but you're getting this by you paying once, you're getting this every single year forever. So that's why it's such a special deal that will never happen again. It's like this, uh, we're doing it because we want to build this really amazing Web3 community. Um, and, he, you know, over time, the, the 10,000 that become part of this initial Web3 community will be 
you know, a really elevated kind of member of our overall ecosystem. Um, you're a technology guy. That's that's where you start. So I want to hear more about, you know, that that journey of yours. But how did you get into music and music festivals? How, how far back do we go? And and what are some of your first memories? Yeah, so I, I think that the core reason is to, to reason we launched this company in general was because of all the different entrepreneurial pursuits I've had along the way. Um, you know, I've been an entrepreneur for well over 20 years. Um, you know, I first I launched my first company in 1999. So uh, it was an e-commerce company that I sold in 2001. Um, and then the event side of it was, you know, a couple of things is even before I launched that first company, you know, my, my good friend, uh, Pat and I used to throw these big multiple, multiple thousand person New Year's parties. I was always interested in people coming together and, and being a part of things. Uh, and then for most of the 2000s, I ran a experiential marketing agency about 70 people um, in, in the agency. And we would bring a lot of big major brands into live events, into festivals, into concerts, into um, touring you know, activations. Um, we also helped launch a, a few film festivals. Uh, we helped launch uh, the Vail Film Festival. We own the Dominican International Film Festival down in the VR. Um, so that was really that period of time, about 10 years of my life you know, brought me to really, really love and enjoy uh, live events. You know, I still think they're one of the most special kind of interactions for culture and people in general. I think it's where this passion connected experience has happened. Um, and then fast forward, you know, from the business side, I, I had a SaaS business in, in the retail franchise space, sold that in 2014. And then right before Festival Pass, I had founded a company called Predict Analytics, which still exists today, but we helped create um, uh, data strategies um, for many, many in the television and film world. Um, so a &E Networks, AMC Networks, Course Entertainment out of Canada, um, numerous different companies, film studios, uh, people that sold advertising in movie theaters. Um, they were all clients of ours where we would use our, our infrastructure and our strategy to really build their consumer data environment. Um, so a lot of that really kind of fed into where we are today. Um, with Festival Pass, taking you know taking into consideration a recurring business model, uh, which I learned in SaaS, e-commerce, which I learned in my first company, live events, and in, in in my agency world, understanding what how what it takes to put on a live event, and then also uh, the data side of really being able to use data to understand how to build a sustainable business model. Yeah, so you have a, a thousand of these at a time. You're going to have how many NFTs in total? Total will be 10,000. Once we sell out the 10,000 founder NFTs, um, we'll never have a founder NFT again. And how many Festival Pass members are there today? So we have uh, over 70,000 uh, members on the platform um, and we'll continue to grow that into 2023. Ultimately, the goal I think for us is by the end of 2023 to have about a million members and that would be inclusive of even some free members uh, and then you know, to have at least a certain large percentage of those million free members um, turned into, you know, paid monthly or annual subscribers, and then 10,000 of the NFT holders. A free member, are they just, they're buying, if they see an event, they're buying credits, but they don't want to commit to, you know, a month or a year. Is that how that works? Yeah. So a free member is somebody that goes in and anybody here can do that uh, and jump in. You can sign up, create an account, be able to look through uh, the events, see, see what the credit prices are. Um, and if you so choose, you could either use a credit card and pay in USD dollars or crypto to, to go to an event. Um, and and uh, you could buy individual credits and use the credits to save some money. Or you can then upon uh, finding an event you want to go to, we find this is what happens a lot is people will join the platform for free. They'll see an event they want to go to, and then they'll go through the process of checking out for that event. And then right in that checkout process, it will say, hey, upgrade your membership uh, and, you know, get X amount of credits and use them for this event. So it's really kind of like the impetus of saying, hey, it's time to go to this event. I want to go. Uh, now it's time to upgrade and be a paid member. You're in uh, you're in Austin. Great, great uh, music uh, town, city, whatever you want to call, call them, cities. Uh, yeah. Um, great, great music scene in Austin. Um do you try obviously you've been to okeechobee before you started festival have you have you traveled much for for music before or is it just hey wherever whatever's playing in my area 
I mean, I've been lucky enough using live live events as an overall catalyst. I've been lucky enough throughout my life because of the things I've been doing in, in business to, to be a part of a lot. Like, uh, obviously, I mentioned all the film festivals back in the day during that agency world. We travel a lot for a ton of different music and film events, uh, food and wine events. And you know, I've been lucky enough to have been to the World Series, been to the Super Bowl, been to F1, been to NASCAR. Um, there's, there's still a bucket list uh, of mine I haven't been to is Kentucky Derby, but I'll try and make it this year. That's on my list too. It actually goes right around my birthday every year and I'll, I'll get there. I'm hoping to do some work with them. So Kentucky Derby, if you're listening, we got some great ideas on how to enhance the uh, the fan experience. Um, but here it's a great event. The F1 was down here in Miami. It was a huge, huge production uh, is it a fun event to watch in person on TV? What, uh, uh, what was the feeling like when you were there? Yeah, it was, it was, it was a good time. So uh, F1 was here, as, as you mentioned, here in Austin this past weekend. And uh, it, I think it brought in about 500,000 people to, to the racetrack. Um, you can imagine what that does to a, a general smaller city that's only about a million in total anyway. Um, but yeah, people were everywhere. It was packed, tons of celebrities around. And I think what's kind of cool is what happens in and around the event. So, you know, I personally went on Friday, which was really mostly practice runs and Green Day was playing, um, you know, out of the bands playing, I wanted to see Green Day. Um, but uh, so it was slightly less crowded for the, the race itself, but still 50,000 people rolled over to watch Green Day, you know, in the open field, which was kind of fun. Um, so, so that was a good time. And, and, you know, we even, my, my girlfriend and I made it back to the city right after green day to, uh, to go to some after parties. And you, you can imagine the type of people that come through town. There was, we went to one that had a uh, shaggy white club, John and, uh, and Robin Thick was, uh, all playing in this one after party. Um, and then just down the road, I think a couple blocks at another hotel, uh, chain smokers were playing, uh, and then Saturday night. Ed Sheeran was at F1, but Post Malone was also uh, playing at the Moody Theater in Austin, and he he went to one of the after parties right after his show at uh, at the Moody Center. So again, you can imagine the type of people that come in and around during it. There's there's so many bands playing and so, so many celebrities rolling through. Yeah, I just saw Green Day. I was I got a, a floor pass, and it was great. It was at a small place. Green Day is the I saw him had the floor at a bigger arena years ago and that was the best concert i've ever been to they're one of my favorites they still they still got it sing all the hits they bring it too right the energy that comes it's crazy it wasn't as the energy was good the energy in the crowd was part of what made that other one uh such a great show but yeah and it, i saw chain smokers and and post malone they're they're going to be at the super bowl they're always at they're always doing these parties for the events it's it's uh they're great to great to see also but it's interesting to see f1 gain popularity with their you know with the events that they have and they're they're smart they're going to austin they're in miami they'll be in vegas soon they're creating um yeah. you know events for uh, that people who aren't necessarily huge race fans to come to and sure. i think that's something that i i think you know a lot of these festivals can learn from to be like hey, look you when you're at an outdoor festival there's so much room and space to allow for to bring people who might not need to come for the music. You'd be like, I come and just to hang out. It's a, if it's a good day, you listen to some music and there's good food and drink and maybe there's some experience experience there. I think, um, yeah, I think, you know, I think they're learning. I think they're, some just have incredible lineups, right? You have a certain lineups, like that's it. You don't need anything else. You just look at it and, and every time you're like, there's going to be downtime when people are going to, need something else to, to entertain them. Or maybe they don't want to walk, you know, back and forth, depending on how far away these uh, stages are. Yeah, I, I even enjoy like uh, some of the kind of call them second tier, but not even really second tier festivals that integrate, you know, um, music with food and wine and food and beer and all that kind of stuff. To me, those are just really fun to go to because you get an overall experience. Like, unfortunately, at some general music festivals, you know, you're stuck with, just the, uh, you know, the classic pizza and hot dogs and, you know, uh, maybe some brisket or tacos or whatever it is. But uh, if you can go to like a really cool food and wine festival, they got amazing stuff, food to try, amazing wines to try. And, you know, you get some great bands or some great music. Yeah, you see a lot of good acts showing up to some. And again, not maybe the top 
you know, headliners that you would see everywhere, but uh, entertaining. A lot of a lot of good music going on with some of these smaller and the independent. For me, the independent festivals are. I, I love to support them. You know, you get once you get these festivals that get taken over by the Live Nations and the Ticketmaster. It they they're still good, right? They have the power and the money to to make it it, it big. But um, it's big corporations, and now the bigger lineups they have, the more expensive it becomes. And then you have, you know, twenty dollar, you know, twenty dollar drinks, and it's, uh, yeah. it's an expensive venture. You spend eight to ten hours at a day listening. You got to eat, got to drink. One example of a, a good group like that: uh, some friends of mine. They they run something called the Breakaway Festival, um, where they do about currently about five different cities, um, and I think next year they're going to try and do about twenty cities. But, um, you know, what I like about it is totally independent, but they're still bringing in some some great acts, like whether it's Kygo or, you know, folks like that, that uh, but they're doing it in second tier cities. So their kind of spin is we're going to do it in Ohio, in North Carolina, you know, in uh, Kansas. And they're bringing kind of like the the top tier city experience to the lower tier cities. And, you know, the cost is is also reasonable. Right. So instead of. Five hundred dollars for a weekend. It's two fifty for a weekend, or, or two twenty for a weekend. And I think they're doing a really great job, kind of bringing the the big city experience to the second tier cities, uh, and they're independent. So I, anybody here looking for something, check out the Breakaway Festival. Yeah, and you get get you know stuff like that, independent or just starting out. I, I didn't even like country music, and Tortuga Music Festival came down here. It was ninety nine dollars for two days on the beach. I went to go see Sister Hazel and Michael Fronte, not even yeah. Sister Hazel put out a country ish album, but, and I was hooked from there. I mean, it was just, I haven't missed a minute of it. And country music is, is probably, it might be my, I don't know if it's my favorite, but I certainly go to it more country than not. I got Luke Bryan coming up uh, at the amphitheater and it's pretty good music scene here, but we're in South Florida. So sometimes they don't go all the way down, right? Cause you're yeah. gonna, you gotta go all the way back up. So we do miss out on some things and there's, plenty of people who tour and just don't come down here. And so you got to, you know, it's good to get into some of those cities that maybe you never heard of before or that yeah. aren't as, you know, big because people will travel. They'll travel an hour. They'll make a weekend out of it. Some might come across the country if they say, oh, let's find a place we've never been to and and get to go see, uh, go get to see music. What's, uh, what are some of your favorite festivals that you've been to and some that you haven't been to that, you would love to get to. Yeah, I mean, I, I think obviously being here in um, in Austin, it's easy to say ACL is just a great a great festival. It's you know coming from New York, I, I moved here two years ago, and being in New York, uh, it's always difficult to get to something when you're living in Manhattan. So it's kind of like you want to go to some big event. It it takes a while to do it. You know, here in Austin, what's so nice is you know we even drive, you know, we'll drive over to the festival and park across the bridge and just walk into the festival. And, uh, you know, it's like a 10 minute walk in and, you know, and then you leave, it's just super easy in and out. You can walk back into the city after there's a million scooters around people can take. So it's just really convenient to pop in and out of. Uh, and then it's funny to watch as soon as the last act happens, like, you know, 50,000 people descend on downtown and go to all the bars and restaurants. And so anyway, it's just a, it's a good, cool experience in that way. Um, so, you know, again, location, I think is a lot of it. Um, I've personally never been to Coachella, uh, even though I probably should <laughs> go. Um, but again, it's, you know, in order to get there, it's kind of like, uh, you know, I, I can't, I can't opine on it cause I haven't been, but a lot of people love it. Oh, it's not it's, easy to, it's not an easy fit place to get to. And yeah, and so, you got to find good hotel room in Palm Springs and all, all the stuff that goes with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, and then you talk about, you know, even smaller, like whether they're festivals or, or just even just general events. Like um, when I moved down to uh, Texas, I, I too didn't know much about country. And, uh, you know, luckily I happen to have a neighbor who's a, a well, pretty well-known country guy. And, uh, and the fascinating thing is, you know, he'll, he'll tour all through Texas and some of the Southern states um, throughout the year playing 150 shows and you know his music is amazing but like i've never would have heard of him um and i think that's what's kind of cool what you're saying is that if you can find in and and get to know a, an act or a band or or something 
through some smaller festival or, or playing on a side stage at a bigger festival, then all of a sudden, like you have this new favorite artist that you can kind of bounce around when that, when they're in town or when they're coming through or follow. Um, so anyway, I think all that's really cool. How about venues? Is there a venue you, you haven't been to? It's a good question. I've been to some great ones. I love Red Rocks. It's one of the best venues out there in Colorado. Um, there's a couple here in Texas, which I keep hearing about, smaller venues that I haven't been to. I've been to all the major ones here in Austin and obviously in New York City and, you know, most in most of the major cities. I've been to a lot in L.A. and, and Miami. Um, there's one here I haven't been to yet in Texas called the Whitewater Amphitheater that gets a bunch of bands coming through it. It's about half hour south of where I'm at. Um, I keep keep threatening to go and I keep forgetting to go. Um, but that's something I'll definitely do. Um, but my, my thing is I love like ample theaters. Like I love the 10 to 15,000, you know, at most kind of environment where you can go and really just be a part of it. It's almost like a mini festival, right? You're outdoors, you're, you're with amongst people that actually want, want to see the band. Um, the ones that are less exciting for me and I'm not, <laughs> it's just honest, honest opinion is, you know, going to large arenas, um, you know, just aren't as exciting. Um, for me, you know, I, I think I, I agree. I, I'm an amphitheater guy outdoors, no matter what, but even if it's going to be an indoor, it's got to be for me, a small, a smaller venue. We, you know, go to a big arena, unless I'm on the floor, I sat in the, in the stadium for Lady Gaga and it's, you know, it's cool, but you're sitting in your seat and I don't, I'm in the lawn. I don't sit down. I, I just want to be able to sort of roam free. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So I think we're, we're on the same page and, uh, uh, one of the things that I was going to say was fun about the after party after F1 is it was at ACL Live, which is typically a venue. I don't know if you've been there, but it's typically a venue that has it has a balcony and seats, but the main area in front of the stage is the floor, right? The pit. So, you know, it's all GA and usually people would uh, go and enjoy it. But um, what was cool is because of, I'm sure it's because of the high price of the after party tickets, but they turned the whole floor into like a, a lounge where they had carpets and couches and table service but it was such a great energy uh maybe it's that old 80s 90s music that brought it but uh it's a great energy everybody was standing nobody was sitting and, and throughout the entire arena the crowd was just excited to be there excited to hear everybody singing along to to the music it was just it just turned it was one, one of the better shows i've been to even though it was like you know shaggy wyclef and uh and robin thick wouldn't have been the people like i immediately would buy tickets to but getting there was great no, I love seeing that those kind of shows, though. You know, it's when you go to an event again, not something that you might buy a ticket for, but when you're there, it's a, it's a fun time. De a ACL definitely something I need to get to. Red Rocks is on the list. I'm gonna get there um, next year, and, and that's one of those venues that probably doesn't matter who I see, but for some reason I feel like I gotta go. You know, I want to go to someone that I'm excited excited to see. Just yeah, you know, the anticipation for it. The, um, and yeah. I think we're, we're both Jersey guys, right? So you, yeah. you, you can't, you got to give a call out to the Garden State Art Center. Yeah, that's where I saw my first concert, uh, the Garden State Art Center uh, uh, Culture Club at the Garden State Art Center. I went with my family. Uh, but they, I think they don't, someone told me they don't allow tailgating anymore. Yeah, that, that was uh, true I, in high school. I used to go there in high school and we used to always tailgate. <laughs> We'd always have a keg in the back of the trunk and had a great time. And uh, But eventually they, they did stop that. But, uh, but uh, I, I'm sure that at some point, um, you know, if you're a reasonable adult that has, you know, a bottle of wine, yeah. uh, they're, they're not going to crack down too hard. Yeah, the police aren't coming after you. But the amphitheater is, uh, it's such a... That's what I love about you. Get in the lot, you know, and hang out for a little bit. Go in, hang on the lawn. Um, they're all owned by Live Nation now. Almost all of these amphitheaters are. Yeah. And so, um, and, and look, Live Nation, take a master. I have a lot of good things to say about them. I have a lot of bad things to say about them. What I want to hear from you is what's what's really good that's going on in the event world and, and what is something that you would like to have changed? If you were in charge of, all of this. And I, you know, I always lean towards concerts and festivals, but a lot of it's the same, you know, throughout most of these events, sports. Yeah, I would say what's good is um, I think 
post pandemic, there's a lot of investment going in to expand live entertainment. Um, talking about venues I haven't been to and that were just built. There's a brand new venue in Huntsville, Alabama um, that um, I'm trying to remember the name of it off the top of my head, but it's a brand new kind of amphitheater, even better than an amphitheater environment. Uh, and that kind of sits, you know, halfway between Nashville and, and Atlanta. Um, and it was uh, created, I'm trying to trying to remember the name. It was, it's a, it's a guy that's in a, in a pretty well-known band is the CEO oh, of yeah. the company. Uh, ben, why am I forgetting this off the top of my head? Uh, I'll tell you in two seconds. I remember, I remember looking at that and hearing about that. There's also a new, we did a, a cool thing for the Thunder Ridge Nature's Arena in, okay. uh, in the Ozarks. Very cool. It's done by the so, guy. So Bass Pro Shops, and it's a really cool. That, those are my favorite type of types of things. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I think Red Rocks is so cool. It's outdoors, right? But the backdrop and just yeah. you know, the, the views of it. No, I agree. So, so I, I think just to answer your question, it was. Um, so I think there's a lot of new investment going into cool venues, cool spaces. You know, I haven't been yet, but I know there's a, a billion dollar sphere being built in Las Vegas that hopefully will be some cool shit that comes out of it. Um, so that's all the good stuff. You talk about the bad is, you know, or if I could change anything, I'm kind of already doing that, right? So my way of changing things isn't, you know, telling other people they're doing it wrong. It's simply saying, let me just try and create a new way for people to experience things. Let me try and take away some of the friction. Let, let's make it more of a community, more membership driven. You know, I think it's been too transactional for decades where people don't really care about the brand they're getting the ticket from. It's more about just let me get it and get there. Um, and I, I think that should change. I think it should all be a community driven experience. I think people should be able to talk to each other um, before a show, during a show, after a show. I think the the ability, you know, through Discord and other community engagement for people to actually um, connect around passions. Um, so we're, we're doing that with Festival Pass and hopefully, you know, it will resonate with the fans and hopefully in a few years, you know, some of the big players will say, hey, you know, that is a better way to do it. And let's l let me learn from you, the small guy doing really cool, unique things that make the fans happy and still try it, and, you know, and still have it be a profitable business model. Um, but let's let's have that shared experience where the audience is part of the are as part of the program. They're not just, you know, a pure consumer making me money. Yeah. I saw, I love the article that was going around or the story about Mark Hoppus when he was trying to buy the blink tickets for it and he got did you see that? I did not. I don't know so what that he, is. It was going around. He he said, Hey, I tried to buy blink tickets for one of our shows and I got kicked out. He's like, I, I you know, I understand how frustrated some fans are who have to go through that experience. And look, the Green Day show that I went to recently, I had wanted to buy and I had these tickets in my it was in my account it wouldn't let me buy it wouldn't let me buy it. then it kicks me out next time i get in nothing's available i ended up having to scalp outside it was at a casino so we ended up getting lucky you know they always give away tickets and someone just sells them for less than they should um yeah. we got in uh, pretty good but yeah it's um you know trying to get fair access and i know part of what you do is secondary market my uh my father-in-law is a, a ticket broker but uh, there's got to be a better way to get fan direct, you know, tickets directly to the fans, especially the ones who are big. And I know some some fan clubs do that, and even that sometimes they fail. Um, yeah. You know, holding back inventory. There's different ticket strategies that I think are obnoxious and uh, probably borderline not legal, right? I mean, we talk about ticket masters essentially a monopoly, even though they're not, but close enough. I I, well, I think there's got to be someone who comes along and kind of just takes a, a, like a slice away from Ticketmaster. Just there's so much money that people have. I like, think about if Elon Musk, instead of buying Twitter, wanted to, you know, invest in a ticket kind of company. And there's always these stories in my eyes, like, well, Ticketmaster is the bad person or it's the, the artist who's greedy. Yeah. It's probably a little bit of each. I mean, I know Pearl Jam was suing Ticketmaster. And now they're a Ticketmaster uh, band. Right, but they can play anywhere they want. Like they don't need Ticketmaster. If sure. they say I'm done with Ticketmaster, I'm going to play, and I'm only going to play in venues that don't use Ticketmaster. Yeah, I mean, I, I, from from my perspective, right, is I hear everything you're saying, 
you know, I try not from our company perspective, um, you know, try to say any, anybody's bad or not bad or whatever it is. It just, there, there's a, there's a reason why the ecosystem has all the different players it does. And at the end of the day, what, what changes any industry is the consumers, right? So the, the, the audience, the people that buy, the people that do it. And if you can find a way to offer a better product and let enough of those consumers know about it, eventually that the, the, the momentum of that happens and it shifts. I mean, that's what happens is, you know, why, why was uh, MySpace big one day and then they weren't? And then why was Facebook big? And then now it's, you know, now TikTok, like it's, it's really all about providing uh, a, a consumer experience that people are more wanting to participate in. And that's what changes it. So, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Web3. I talk about the NFTs, but just the Web3 philosophy that the community should be part owners in the process. Um, I'm a big fan of, so we're doing everything I can to, uh, you know, really make that happen. And hopefully there's a big enough groundswell where, um, you know, others take notice and want to change like we're trying to change. I think there's a lot of people who complain, but then they're part of the problem because they're bad consumers and they kind of just jump at everything. The issue possibly with NFTs and Web3 is also that everyone wants to jump in and offer something that's really not, there's no worth to it. And so, you know, I'm with you. I try and I, I don't, I try not to talk about what others are doing wrong, but then I also sometimes point out what others are doing wrong because I want everyone in the industry to do better. I'm not trying sure. to say don't use them. I'm trying to say, Hey, if you're going to use them, let's have it better. So when you do offer something, people don't just have this bad taste in their mouth about whatever that is, whether it's an NFT or a commemorative ticket that they bought, you know, a festival wristband an event. Um, I think we all, we need to challenge. So whether it's someone who is using someone all the time, you know, just challenge them as a consumer, as a vendor, uh, you know, just uh, challenge everyone to do better. And I want to be challenged to do better. Um, and, and we're doing that all, all the time, just trying to get a better offering because it really should all be about the fans. And I think if we treat the fans right, the money will be there. It's it's yep. the money will be there. So not to have greed. My change thing I would do, waters should never be above $2 a bottle. It just should never. You should never be selling sure. water for more than $2. And, and you look at these festivals. I mean, these people need water. And people yeah. aren't going to buy six dollar water when they should be drinking it. True. Um, that's my that that's the one thing I probably would change. No, I agree. And there's a balance, right? I was saying we were uh, we're partnering with a water that is at a lot of festivals, and I don't recall what the price point is for Liquid Death when they're there. But you know, at least at least some of the things they're doing well is that they're making it cool to drink water, and people are feeling like they should drink more of it, and you know, even you know, people feeling like it's okay to have a can of liquid death rather than it is to, you know, have a beer and, and that's okay. Um, so anyway, they made it cool, at least to be hydrated. Uh, the cost perspective is something that you're talking about that needs to be addressed. Yeah. It's because uh, there's enough money. They're selling a ton of them and it's more about health and safety. And, um, yeah. but I mean, the margins on it, on a bottle of water selling it for two bucks is still outrageously. It's, uh, it's still pretty good. I would yeah. think um what's what's next for you guys uh you got the nft you're always trying to you know enhance the value is, is what the that is what the pass is today going to look very similar a year from now i know you're looking to grow but is yeah. this that you can work on in the meantime oh yeah we we got a ton of stuff going on so uh you know the, the other thing i didn't mention is is any of the holders of the past for curating these quarterly kind of bucket list events so, um, you know, if somebody holds the pass, not only do they get all the credits I mentioned, which is the utility, but they also can attend our quarterly events. Um, so they could be, you know, a, a small show with a well-known music artist. It could be going to, uh, you know, a professional sports game and hanging out with the players after. It could be getting a celebrity chef to cook dinner for 50 of our NFT holders. So each quarter, we're going to be letting the NFT holders vote on kind of which event that we should be holding for them. Um, so that's going to be fun. So that will get more and more interesting, you know, as we sell out all 10,000 and have more and more people voting upon what events they want to go to. So that's going to be fun. Um, some of the other tranches that we're going to be selling in the future will be associated with different personalities. Um, you know, part of our uh, 10,000 total and a thousand each tranche is each of the thousand has a specific art to them. 
Um, right now it's legend. He's more of a rocker. Uh, it's not a specific uh, personality, but we already have some agreements in place with, you know, some personalities that are like super fans that are kind of well known in the NFT space. Um, we also are close to closing some deals with, you know, a celebrity chef for one of, to to be the art for one of the tranches, a professional athlete to be the art for one of the tranches. Every well trade, I mean, if I bought now and I don't really like the art on it, would there be an opportunity to trade with someone? Would there, or is that? Well, there's always an opportunity in the secondary market, right? So you can yeah. always go to OpenSea and sell it. And then in return, yeah, buy the other one. So the, the core underlying utility will be the same for all of them. But the, I think the point of the reason we're doing this is for the fun and gamification of it, right? So if somebody's a music fan, they're going to want the music art. If somebody's a culinary fan, they're going to want the, the chef. If somebody's a sports fan, they're going to want the sports guy. Because as you know, kind of that, that art, that image is representative of who they are, whether they want to use that to post it as their profile image on Twitter or anywhere else, they'll feel more comfortable posting the one that's more related to who they are. Yeah. You know, we're gonna have one that's a DJ. So if you're into EDM and, and you know electronic music, you're gonna want the DJ, that kind of stuff. I didn't ask this question. If I buy a pass, I have all this credit. I mean, I could get anyone into an event, right? It's, I, it's not me that has to go into this event, correct? Yeah, so you're the one that's gotta buy the ticket. So you have to log into your Festival Pass account, use your credits to get the ticket. The ticket gets transferred to you electronically. And then once it's in your possession, you, you know how it works on if it was a Ticketmaster event or an AEG event or whatever the ticketing company is, most uh, allow for direct electronic transfer. So once it's in your possession, you can send it to whoever you want. Yeah, no, that's a good idea. Gifting and it's just a good, it's a good value. It's a good idea um, for people who go to enough events, right? You got to figure, you do the simple math. I buy a lawn pass for the amphitheater. I do the math. I'm going to go yep. to enough events. Um, and I could buy and sell or to my friends, same, you know, if someone wants okay. to get, get them to go. So that's good. Uh, who, who haven't you seen it live that you would love to see? Ah, good question. Um, I know you're probably like me. You've seen almost everyone that you want to, but there's still yeah, I mean, I just like discovering new bands, right? So it's like, you know, I'm an old rock and roll guy. My first concert ever was Rush at uh, Meadowlands. You know, like that kind of shit. I've been to the Grateful Dead. I've been to, you know, Rolling Stones. I've been to, you know, a lot of, a lot of great bands. The Who. Who was the best new one then? Who was the best new artist that you discovered live? Um, I do like uh, a bunch of like cool, and maybe it's being in Texas now. Some of the cool jazz guys, like Leon Bridges. I don't know if you know Leon Bridges. He's an amazing guitarist. Uh, you know, he he plays both at festivals and at small Big venues. Guy, yeah. Yeah, but he also plays at cool small venues and you know I, I love going to a great small venue to you know somebody like him just rocking out on the guitars you know good stuff for me um who else I'm trying to think of some just just great electrifying shows i mean you know even though i like the small uh the small con concept you know i've been to a few big arena shows which can get pretty electric and it's not you're there not necessarily to see who's on stage but you're looking at 80,000 people with light up lights going and shit like that. But uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure I have any one specific person. If you like country, I was mentioning my buddy, John Wolf. He's got, he's got a great album out, uh, you know, so you should write that down if you're a little bit of a country fan, J-O-N Wolf. Um, and he's, he's tours all through kind of the central, central US and I, I bet he'll be national soon. He's, his music is great. I'll check them out. What's the best restaurant? What's your favorite restaurants in uh, in Austin? I La Barbecue is my favorite barbecue. I go. Have you been to Salty Sal? I have been to Salty Sal a couple Salty times. Sal and then uh, yeah. in to Juan or Juan in a Million, my favorite breakfast spot. Oh yeah, and that's over on the east side, Juan in a Million. Um, all, all good stuff. Um, yeah, there's there's a couple cool spots. There's you know Justine's, which is a cool little French spot uh, over on the east side. There's uh, and then. The cool thing about Austin is you get all these like kind of outdoor big open spaces that are just fun. They're not fancy or anything, but like whether it's Central Machine Works on the east side as well across the street from Justine's, it's just a big open area where you can order your own food. It's good food. You order your own drinks. Um, it's just a huge old airplane airplane hangar space, which is awesome. Then there's a great little joint called Cosmics uh, down on uh, South Congress, which you can go during the day for coffee, at night for drinks, and 
they have some of the best food trucks. I was just watching, uh, there was a, a somebody, somebody feed Phil, a TV show. I don't know if you know the TV show. Uh, so uh, they just were here in Austin. They were talking about some of the best barbecue and brisket was at this food truck at Cosmex. Um, in addition to La Barbecue and all the other ones you talked about. You're a Rainy uh, Street guy or a Fifth Ave? Uh, well, Rainy Street is fun to go to, but it's uh, it's mostly college kids. I'm a little too old for that. But uh, but if if you're if you're in your 20s and even in your 30s, man, Rainy Street is a blast. It's a ton of fun. And if you know if you just want good food, Bangers is over on Rainy, which is a they make their own sausage. They make their own sausage. It's like total great pork thing. Sometimes they'll throw a pig up on a on a uh, fire on a fire spigot for a Saturday afternoon and get the full pig. It's all yeah, fun shit. Good, good beers and good sausage at that place. Um, we're going to let you out of the wolf den with the same question everyone gets. You can spend a day with anyone in the world. They have to be alive and you can't be related to them. Who would you choose and, and what would you guys do? Good question. I mean, I, I can say the, the easy answer, but it's not the most uh, authentic or it's, it's authentic. It's just not that most original is I, I, I'm lucky to have a lot of friends that have been down to Necker Island with Richard Branson. I personally have yet to been, um, but I, I would like to go in the future. And, you know, he's not only is he an inspiration from an entrepreneurial standpoint, um, you know, from what I hear from many is he's just a good human. Um, I know he's been married to the same wife for Joan for many, many years. He's got kid, great kids. He's a family man, but at the same time, he, you know, spent half his uh, half his year chilling out on a nice Caribbean island. So where, I'd like where would to, you like to hang out? What would you like to do? Have I'd like to go out with him, but yeah, I'd like to chill down on the island, have some great conversation about entrepreneurship, go kiteboarding with him, um, you know, have a nice glass of wine, just really kind of shoot the shit. I think Pete, he's been mentioned before. You get a lot of people like that with the one of Elon Musk. He's, you know, uh, just leaders and, 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 just incredible, the incredible things that they've created. Um, and to hear about the stuff that, you know, they failed at too, I think is yeah. a lot of value in that too. Not that you need to fail to succeed, but it's always yeah. good. You know, Happens. Happens. Failed Happens. Many times and got back on the horse. That's true. Yeah. The failure, it, failure only happens when you quit. Other, yeah. Otherwise it's just a learning experience. Yeah. It was just a failed part of the bigger, the bigger plan. Check out festivalpass.com. Again, we have the uh, NFT at family.festivalpass.com. That's uh, available for a limited time until they sell out. Uh, great value there. Uh, looking forward to, to seeing what comes next and, and taking a look at some of the events that you have. I, I think I'm a member, a free member. I got to take a look at the uh, events and see what's going on. But if you have any questions, check them out. They're all over the web at Get Festival Pass. Um, and that's their handle on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Ed, thank you for joining uh, I'll see you at a, at one of these conferences or events sometime soon. Sounds great, Matt. Appreciate being on. Right. Thanks, man. Thanks, Ed.